Hey Dennis, would you like to uh, <laughs> retroactively introduce that tune and offer a little context for it? I would, but uh, before I do that, I'd like to say just first of all, thank you all for coming. Um, as I was explaining uh, to Noam Henry when we first met, this is kind of, for me, this is like having an out-of-body experience. <laughs> um, because primarily, um, my, my role as a musician has always primarily been as a side man. I'm that person, I'm, one way to think about me, I'm kind of like one of those secret service people. You're not supposed to see me, you're supposed to see the people that I'm either working for. So when I came in and we, we started playing this music, and it's the first time that I've had, ever had the opportunity to play this music with people who really, in a way, knew it so well. And, uh, I'm slightly overwhelmed, but, uh, <laughs> but thank you all for coming. Um, that was, uh, all the pieces that we're going to play are, composi are either compositions of mine or they're very special uh, pieces of music. Um, and usually when I write something, there's got to be a, a, a reason. Um, most of all of these songs are going to have some story. And this was a, a piece that was entitled, And That's That. And it was the first thing that I had ever written for uh, Count Basie's orchestra. I was very blessed in that when I was 20 years old, I was the drummer. I was the last drummer that Mr. Basie actually hired. And I worked with him uh, his last year, or my first year with him, the year before he passed. And he was always very loving and very giving. And so I was saying, you know, you, you're a writer. I want you to write me something. So I wrote this. And I was so, I was terrified. <laughs> uh, I was terrified because I was the youngest on the band. I didn't know whether they would like it, the, the, the members of the band, whether he would like it. And my mother, who has always been my champion, she was the one who used to take me to jazz clubs when I was like 10 years old and sit with me and you know, tell the club owner, this is my son, he's he wasn't playing drums. So she said, you know, I, I, I said, she saw I was, I was worried. And she says, listen, don't worry about a thing. You just write what you feel right from your heart, and that's that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what this is called, and that's that. <laughs> I love that. Nice. I'll point out that there's a whole bunch of things that I wanted to ask Dennis when we uh, met this morning to rehearse. Uh, and uh, I, I specifically saved all of those because I figured y'all would want to know. So, so now I know that. Um, <laughs> um, do we have any questions at this time? If not, I'm sure we will soon enough. Anything up front? Yes, Noah. Yeah. You've had other drummers come. So not, not to put you higher or lower than that. But <laughs> the previous drummer, um, I, I, I remember asking her, when you, you write your song, you're, you're a drummer. I used to play drums when I was in high school. I was primarily a sax player, but I also played drums. So I, I knew my instrument, my saxophone, which was my primary instrument. So I could write a music song on that. But as a drummer, do you play other instruments? Because if you're writing songs, it's not all but shit, it's, it's other other <laughs> <laughs> a lot more to it. So how, yeah, what other instruments do you play? Do you have a musical background before you start drums? Or uh, you know what yeah. As far as, when I first started, my mother said I was two. She said I just started. My father was in the military. He was in the Air Force. And so he'd come back from Japan and had chopsticks. Yes. <laughs> yes. So she immediately figured, well, he must be a drummer. So I've been playing drums all my life. But at one point, I just was so fascinated about music. And in our home, she loved um, organ players like Jimmy Smith and, and Lou Holmes and all of them, and, and pianists, uh, Errol Garner, Oscar Peterson. So even though drums were my primary instrument, I still was fascinated with just sound in general. Bass was my second instrument. I did start playing bass when I was in high school, and I always dabbled just playing at the piano. And even though I didn't have any actual formal training or theory lessons, I would just put my hands on the keyboard and just come up with sounds and just try to figure things out. And the, the mechanics of actually notation and understanding key signatures and all that, that, that came later. But specifically, when I do write music, I do sit at a piano 
and figure out the melody and what changes they are and, and so forth. So that a musician's can play. And has that process changed as the technology has changed, notation software and such? Yeah, yes, uh, I was explaining one of the pieces we're going to play. I, I, I remember it because it's the last time I actually used my hands to write this <laughs> music. <laughs> and, uh, this was at this is in the nineties when we all went to the computer. So now I pretty much do everything on the computer. Having said that, um, the process is still a, a MIDI keyboard, and I'll actually hear the sounds. There, when people write music, there are great musicians that can just think of a melody and just write it down without even using a piano. I still need a piano. Uh, on the Basie Orchestra, Frank Foster, one of the great leaders that we had, Rhodes Shines Dawkins, I could sit, I sat across from him and across from Thad Jones as well on the bus. Mm. And both of them could, Frank could listen to music, listen to something completely different, and start writing a, a, an arrangement. And just from seeing it, he would just, it would be perfect. He used to write it in pen. <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> Are there any other questions before we play the next tune? Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. So, so when, when you have an inspiration for a new tune, mm -hmm. does that inspiration come from a melodic point, or a harmonic point, or a rhythmic point, or does it vary depending on the tune? It varies depending on the tune. In a way, and then there are some people who wake up and they hear a song. Usually for me, uh, either Someone calls and says, we need, I need a deadline, first thing. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need this in a week. And um, every now and then, they'll be a melody. But usually, either like, like in the case of that last piece, you know, Mr. Basie said, you know, write me something. There was, there was a, a, a need first, or, or, or a request first. Um, when you have to, when you have a deadline, and you've got like a, 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 a a short period of time, you're, you're actively searching for what's around you. Sometimes it'll be a melody, sometimes they will hear a set of chord changes. Usually for me, it would start with the chord changes first, and I love to hear the progressions, and then I can come up with a melody that works with the changes. Um, very rarely do I just hear like some melody in my head, but sometimes, maybe like a fragment. Sometimes it'll be a, a rhythm, and I'll try to come up with changes that work with the rhythm. It just, it, it really varies from, from song to song. But the, the most important thing is I just, writing takes time and it's, it's, it's work for me. So I, I just have to have like a deadline. <laughs> and if you tell me we need it by five o'clock tomorrow, five o'clock tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, this gentleman. Yes. Yeah, this is similar, but when you're like composing something, do you find that most of your ideas have come from like improvising on the piano and then playing something wrong and being like, oh, that sounds really good? Sometimes. Um, we were, you should have been here at, at like noon. We were having this great conversation. <laughs> um, you uh, know, I had mentioned that uh, Joanne Rakim, a uh, great pianist, sometimes like, she would just play and record things. This is long before uh, everybody has like a recording studio in their computer. What I used to do when I was in school, I would used to have like, an old cassette recorder. And I would just sit down at the piano and just write chords. And then because I couldn't play piano well enough to play chords and a melody, I would maybe you know, come up with a series of chord changes and then maybe kind of sing a melody on top of it or just kind of, or I'll start to maybe play after I could hear the chords they played back to me. Sometimes that gives you inspiration. Sometimes, yeah, you'll play, you'll, you'll come up with a wrong note, but maybe you like that note, so you try to change the chords to make it fit. It, it really, all composers, I think, have their own process. Some people, um, some people will look at this room and they'll say, okay, well, these are going on. These, these beams are going down. So let's say these are down beats. And then the white part of the room, those must be up beats. So let's see, one, two, and then up. You, you can come up with it. It's almost like a game you can play with yourself. Where you can try to find anything in life and figure out how to make a song out of it. And that's sometimes what you have to do if you have a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, so let's, why don't you set up the next one? So I don't know what you say, um, which is...
Yeah. yeah, right. So again, um, with a lot of these pieces, they all have some significance, usually to people who have been important in their life. Um, I, mean, I, I can't tell you how blessed I have been to be able to work with amazing musicians. Um, and not just great players, but people who were really you know, mentors and role models. Um, this composition was written for George Sheeran. I was very lucky to be able to be in the George Sheeran Quintet. And in fact, um, was the last drummer for the George Sheeran Quintet. We with George pretty much for about 15 years. And we did a tour uh, in, in the United States. We toured all over the world, but we were, uh, we did a tour, we, we had a, we were doing a lot of, on a, you know, a lot of traveling on a bus. And so you kill time on a bus. George loved to play cards. Mm -hmm. And so he loved to play hearts in mm -hmm. this game. So um, this was a song that I had written for the quintet. We didn't get a chance to, to, to play it live, but I, I wrote it for him. And it's entitled King of Hearts. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. Um,
open it up to more questions. I have a question. Um, I suspect I'm not the only person in this room wondering this. Um, how did George Shearing play cards? <laughs> so George Shearing was uh, was blind. Um, um, and uh, so do you have braille cards? Or? Okay. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> This is okay. He, he knew my <laughs> He loved to. He was a fun guy. He was just fun to be around, and he loved to, to play games and cards and, and practical jokes and little things he used to love doing. He didn't carry uh, when we when I was on the road with him. He didn't have a scene night off, but there were times that he did. And so what he used to love to do was he would go to the airport and. Um, Sometimes, you know, some of the flight crews would see, oh, this is Mr. Sheriff. And he says, you know, he, 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 his wife was always with him. and said, well, George is a pilot. So he would love to say, well, listen, you know, uh, Catherine, would, I would be honored if you would maybe take my dog and, and you know, maybe, you know take, take the dog to, to, to the plane where they would, you know, they could boss him for him. And he would just enjoy watching people see the captain of an airplane with a seeing eye dog. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, he's fun. He was really good. <laughs> that, he could count money. I mean, he could just get any, any bill. His sense of touch was so good. He wow. Knew all, he was a very, very good guy. Sherry touch? Yeah. Uh, I didn't think about it in that context. <laughs> Thank you. Um, more questions? Yes, Michael. I sense, and that was a beautiful uh, piece that you put in. I sense a little bossa nova mm -hmm. type rhythm that you were tying in. Was that what you were going for? You know, and you, I also, uh, not to cut you off, I think a little saxophone would have been that. Sorry, I don't play saxophone. <laughs> Did you ever think of adding a, a, a woodwind or, or you know, wind uh, instrument to that piece? You know, this, the, the other real privilege about doing this and why this kind of feels like an out of body experience is because most of these pieces that you're hearing, I've never played before in this context. Usually, for example, if you know you, you get a deadline, a commission, uh, it'll be okay. Um, it's for a big band or it's for this particular instrumentation. The first piece, and that's that, that was written for, for the Count Basie Orchestra. And this piece, uh, originally when I conceived it, it was for the Sheeran Quintet, which was vibes, piano, guitar, bass, and drums. So there was no saxophone. Um, this was played once before. There's a recording on YouTube of, um, of a very impromptu concert that we did up in <laughs> Kingston, New York. And Steve Wilson is playing on a great Jazz Up Close Alumnus 2016. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steve Wilson, Vic Juris, and Jay Anderson. And so, but that was, I think, the only other time that this song was played except here. So uh, the next time you, you speak with Noe, make sure there's a saxophone player. <laughs> <laughs> and regarding the, the actual uh, feel, it wasn't a bossa nova, we have one coming, uh, but this was more of a calypso feel. Mm -hmm. And George uh, was a master at various, if you go through the history of the Shearing Quintet, you know, he had collaborations with Nat King Cole, but he also had collaborations with Tito Puente. Uh, he, he just loved all different genres of music, so it, it's in there somewhere. I, I just knew that there was some sort of, you know, <coughs> Vibe there with the drums, with the, you know, like you said, the calypso feel. I thought it was a little awesome, but yeah, I like it. <laughs> Thank you. The critics have spoken. <laughs> Hi, who are your main influences on, as drummers go? Now I'm looking at the clock. Is that <laughs> <laughs> you know, in a way, okay, here's, I like to. Think of music as I'm not sure what what the painting there is, but there's some painting. If you can imagine just like like a long road in the desert, it just kind of goes, just it just keeps going. 
for me, music is like that. And where, whatever age you are, when you start, you're basically walking down that road. You never really finish. You never really get to the end of it. So um, probably when I first started walking on the road, uh, my musical influences were what my parents were playing at home on the radio or on the stereo, which was Art Blakey was an influence. Uh, Max Roach was a great big influence. Um, uh, strangely enough, I was influenced by a lot of musicians that I didn't know who they were because they were studio musicians. Mm -hmm. There's a drummer, a great New York drummer named Grady Tate. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. And I didn't know who he was, but he was the drummer who played on a lot of the Jimmy Smith records that my mother listened to. He played on a lot of the recordings at Quincy Jones. He was Quincy's go-to drummer. Um, Another great influence was, uh, who came a little bit later, but I heard him all my life, didn't really know I was listening to him, was Mel Lewis. Mm -hmm. So, and all of these musicians, in a way, were kind of the ones who influenced me to become the person in the background. Because there are a lot of recordings, when, you're, when you work in the studios or when you play as a side person, you, you, you've probably heard a lot of recordings that, that maybe I, I'm on, but you had no idea that it was me. Uh, and that was kind of the world that Grady and uh, Bob Crenshaw was a great bass player um, who played with McCoy Tyner, but he also was a bass player for Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> so you grew up listening to jazz musicians, you just didn't know it because they were either on television or, or on recordings. So as far as the road, it, 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 the more you walk down the road, then there become other drummers like, like Billy Cobham, like uh, Alan Dawson. Um, Elvin Jones, Tony Williams, you keep going further down the road, you start going into Lewis Nash and Jeff Hamilton and people that are, are colleagues of mine. So it, it's kind of a, a long, the longer the road, the longer the explanation. <laughs> Thank you. So um, let's uh, move on to the next one. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So, in addition to, uh, again, I've had the privilege of working with all these great musicians. A lot of that has come from being a, a side person. So I was actually, uh, the, the reason that I was hired by George Shearing was because I was actually on a, uh, a performance with the gentleman who I recorded this next piece with. His name is Hank Jones. And Hank was the dean of jazz piano. I, I was recommended by a great arranger named Manny Alba, who was writing a, a recording session for Hank Jones. And uh, Manny had known me from my work with uh, the Mel Lewis, with Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra. And it, it's like, one way I like to describe being a musician, it's kind of like being like a, a small business person, like if you're a plumber or, or, or whatever, um, you're a plumber. So you do a good job in somebody's sink or home or whatever. And then you get recommended by somebody else. And so um, from the Basie Orchestra, I got known for playing in big bands. And that's kind of what, how I got associated with Mel Lewis, and, and the, the, which is now the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra that right. still plays to this day. Um, from that, it became uh, Manny was writing this, who wrote for the Vanguard Orchestra. He was writing a record date for Hank Jones. And so I was with Hank for about 15 years as well. And I was on a, I was, we were playing a concert, uh, and George Sheeran happened to be in the audience. And that's how he heard me, and that's how I got with him. So George was, was kind of second, but Hank was before. The song that we're going to play now was recorded on the, the last recording I did with, with Hank. Um, this song is a very, I think it's, it's, it's amazing. It's actually a, co it's a composition by Harold Mayburn, who was another great, legendary pianist. And he's, he's also kind of another role model. When we used to play all over New York, Harold, who was a legend in his own right, would always be the person like kind of sitting in the back, very quietly, just very respectfully listening. He'd always come out in your hand. And I had no idea who it was. You know, he would come up usually and introduce and say hello to Hank and you know, he would pay his respects. But I had no idea that he was such an amazing composer. And so there's a record that we did called um, For My Father, 
and this record, this song was on it. I think that it kind of sums up a lot of things that, a lot of blessings that I've had in my life. And I think especially after what we've all been through the last couple of years, it really speaks to what I think everybody should have in their mind. We, uh, the name of this song is called um, There But For The Grace. Okay. Um, it goes like this.
not to bogart things, but I have another question. <laughs> uh, so we were talking before about how uh, uh, in, in the business uh, of jazz, we would refer to a slow tune like this uh, by the highly technical term of having a grown folks tempo. Uh, <laughs> because it requires a certain patience and a certain sensitivity and so on that is maybe not what one most associates with youth. No offense to the young people here. And, uh, um, and I guess I'm curious, given how much of your professional identity has revolved around being supportive, being that sideman who is valued and doesn't get in the way, and yet when one thinks about the stereotype of a drummer, it's bombast and flashiness and loud volume and so on. I'm wondering, uh, has it always, especially given your compositional activities and so on, has it always been natural for you to be sensitive and patient and mature and supportive in that way as a drummer, or did it, uh, did it take some conscious doing to develop that? Um, aspect of your musical personality? Well, the short answer is that no, I haven't always been sensitive and supportive. <laughs> 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 I, supportive. Um, I would say that we are all products of our environment. And again, I can't, <coughs> I'm not sure I can really convey how um, important and how lucky and blessed I was to be with great musicians, especially great <coughs> leaders, that were very nurturing and very patient. And you know, you, watching their by by use by watching their example. For example, uh, when Mr. Basie would run the band, I never remember him ever getting angry and screaming. He was he, when you talk about. Uh, patience. He just had a way of, if, if something was wrong, he let you know, but he did it in a very gentle, calm, mature, patient way. Uh, George Sharon, the same thing, Hank Jones, the same thing. They weren't, um, they were not aggressive, violent, angry, quick to do anything. They weren't in a hurry. And even when I, when I was, they they, they always would kind of correct me in a very gentle way. And never in a way where you felt bad about what you did. Basically used to have this really cool thing, and I'll never forget this. Um, I would be playing, and if I made a mistake, I would look over, but somehow he was always looking at me. <laughs> but it was so clear, because you know, he would, things he did, he never used to look like that. But whenever I did something wrong, he was for some reason he was he would never look at me. He was always you know, and it was a very it was a way to let you know you clearly knew he didn't miss it. But the fact that like he gave you the, he gave you a break, you know, he kind of like and I think that kind of gave me it, it brought me in to recognize that yeah, there's value in 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 patience. There's value in in playing at a tempo where you're not trying to prove everything to everybody. There's, that's important because they were the model for that. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it took a long time to get that. Uh, <laughs> but it's something that I, I'm on eternally grateful for. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do we have any other questions at this time? Well, I won't keep soliciting because I have a job that I did to play this next one. But, um, <laughs> Tell us about, about Joy's movie. Well, Joy was my mother, once again. Uh, the other thing about this, too, this was another deadline. Um, in addition to working with, with the bass orchestra, we had uh, the privilege of working with a lot of great vocalists. We would work, sometimes the band would do a concert, but then we would be paired with Ella Fitzgerald, and we'd be paired with Sarah Vaughn. And when we would work with Ella Fitzgerald, her, the way it would work is that the rhythm sections, her pianist would come and be the piano conductor, and the rhythm sections would change. So I would get up, and it was at that time it was Bobby Durham, the great drummer, and Keeter Betts was the bass player for Ella. And I was lucky in that Keeter eventually, after he had left Ella, had started his own 
group, and he's based in the, in the Washington, D.C. area. So uh, he had called me, myself, Bill Charlotte was in that band, uh, a great saxophone named Jerry Weldon, and a great trumpet named Pete Maynard. And as Keener was not a writer, he would you know, say, listen, I want, you to, I want you guys to bring some stuff. And he would tell us that, um, well, OK, so concert's tomorrow. We need something. <laughs> There's a piece we're not doing. It's a piece called Spur of the Moment. That's exactly what we're doing. <laughs> That's what that time came from. But uh, again, because uh, th there was something that I needed to, to be quick, and I thought about how much my mom used to love the blues. So this is called Joy's Blues.
Thank you. Uh, so, do we have other questions at this time? Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Have that. I'd like to just elaborate on what you said about that band where you're saying, okay, well, we got to come up with something, but you were in the right position, Mr. Deadline. <laughs> well, it's, it's an important skill to have if you want to do it. You know, I, I'm known, in fact, my life is put to point out to me that I can talk and talk and talk. So, <laughs> these ex, you know, a lot of times if I get rolling, I want, please, if you have questions, I want to <laughs> just keep going and going and going. So. Uh, back there. First of all, thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you me. mentioned that last song was from your mother. Yes. Um, has she asked? Yes, she has. How far along did she see the success that you had? Mm -hmm. if, she, if she did, I mean, I can only imagine. She gets to see it with some of the great names She did. Um, unfortunately, she passed. She was very young. She was 50 when she passed. Oh, my God. Uh, and, but she, I, I was with Basie. She, she, was, she, she saw that. She did get to see me play with, with Mr. Basie. Um, she passed in, in, in 86. And uh, at Mr. Basie was there, then Thad Jones came on the band, and so she she didn't get to see, get to meet Hank Jones or George Sharon, but she was she loved Basie, so that would happen. <laughs> <laughs> she was cool with that. <laughs> Thank you. Alice, go ahead. I don't have a question. I just want to comment that I'm in absolute awe of having this great music here in the library museum. Yeah. 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 As from this end of, of the room, are we that there's such a supportive community that is willing to spend uh, Saturday afternoon in nice weather um, <laughs> being exposed to music that's maybe not uh, what would be on uh, Top 40 radio? <laughs> I, I do not take that for granted, that this is a community that uh, invites that. Thank you. I will also say that, you know, this is, as I, I said, this, it's like an out-of-body experience for me. Partially because it's so unusual that you find a group of people that, A, like, like you said, would take the time, that also put the energy that's required into keeping this music alive. That's not a, it's difficult to understate or, or to overstate how important what you, just you being here, this is a big deal. This is really important. Yeah. And, um, Thank you. I, I said, mm. wow. thank you for coming. But thank you for obviously um, supporting this series. I thank this gentleman. I got about 10 or 15 emails. I'm hard to reach. <laughs> <laughs> and he was just you know, so together and so on the case. And for me to be the recipient of, of all his work, I, I thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Just like Billy. You know, uh, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 toms. And, you know, <laughs> inches. They were just a, not, not 18 toms, but um, he was a, a, an amazing influence. Um, in addition to being a great influence as a drummer, he was also the first person. There was always a time when, when you had, they were, when they would introduce a band, they'd say, we have you know, 10 musicians and a drummer. And they never used to consider drummers as musicians because we really weren't encouraged to write music. Billy was one of the first drummers that I, when you look at his, at his recordings, uh, they, they were producing his production company. And he was always the one who either did all the arrangements, 
Kim, Louis Belson, and another drummer named Bill Bruford were the three mm -hmm. drummers that I remember seeing, what can we drummers can write? I guess, we're, I guess we, can, we can do this. So he was very um, influential in my even trying to sit at a piano and write music. So I got to thank him for that. Mm -hmm. um, to your question specifically, it really depends on what, this, what the, the genre is. Um, in that particular uh, situation, he's talking about a group called the Mahavishnu Orchestra, which was uh, a jazz rock fusion band. His technical ability was just awesome, number one. Um, but he, I think probably the main thing I listen for is that a drummer is, is plays in a musical way. Um, most people, when you hear drums, it's either too loud, or they play, they either play too loud or too much. And they don't necessarily, um, they, what they do may, may have elements of music, but, the, but there are other elements of music involving, you know, listening, trying to understand what other people are doing and to, and to support them. And that's probably the first thing, is, is, are, is, that, is this drummer listening? Is he, is he aware of what's going on? Does she really know what's really happening with the, with the arrangement? And putting he or her into the group as a, as a, as a part, not as the focus. And so, um, yeah, all the great drummers, they all were great, uh, great musicians. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's interesting how, um, as, a, as an educator, I wind up getting into this conversation with drummers. The, the um, compensatory response to that sometimes, if you're a drummer who's been told, don't be so loud, um, then they'll just be tame. <laughs> and you know, so somebody, somebody who talks too much and doesn't engage in back and forth dialogue, it's not, that's not really <coughs> any worse than someone who won't ever speak up or won't, won't actively participate. And so I wind up with uh, working with drummers sometimes who've been told so many times not to play so loud, so they play in an equally not sensitive and tuned in way, but softer. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and not bringing the energy when it's needed. And so that's how, how you become as employable a musician as Dennis McCrell is in part being able to adapt in either of those directions as the music demands it. In defense of drummers, I think. It sounds like the name of a, of a thesis. <laughs> I teach at Queen's College in, in, in Flushing. And usually the first, when I start off with all my drummers, I always try to, uh, we talk about why they hate us. That's usually <laughs> the first lesson. And unfortunately, a lot of people, I always try to explain to them that most directors or most people that teach, they, they, if they don't play the instrument, they may not necessarily know how to exactly convey their ideas to us. So we have to kind of figure out, we have to learn to speak their language because they can't really speak ours. And a lot of drummers are just been given bad information for so long that they, like exactly what you just said, they, they tend to overcompensate. We mean well. <laughs> but again, with great teachers and great leaders that have the patience to kind of wait, wait you out and wait till you get it, it, it really, it's invaluable. Right. Well, I guess that's a good segue talking about um, sensitivity and burgeoning maturity to play another tune with uh, Roman Folk's Temple. Yeah. <laughs> um, this piece is another piece that was written for Mr. Sheer. Um, I, I'm looking at this clock and I was like, yeah, I, I, can, I can talk for like hours about this man because he was really a great, just a loving person in general. Um, so very briefly, this is called with all my love. <laughs>
for multiple more questions. We'll take them next. I just wondered uh, how it was if your dad was uh, in the Air Force, did you move around a lot when you were young? And do you think that influenced your, your yeah, style? Very much so, actually. Um, I was born in Omaha, Nebraska, <coughs> and at, at off at Air Force Base. But I was, we just lived there for about two years. I don't remember anything about it. We moved to California. We lived in uh, Hawaii, in Honolulu. We were stationed in Anchorage, Alaska. We came back to California. Um, I think that, for one, uh, even though I'm pretty much associated with jazz, I was always, I grew up, I wanted to be a professional musician, not a jazz musician. I wanted to be able to play whatever anybody put in front of me. And uh, a lot of that came from living in all these different places. Sometimes there wasn't a big jazz radio station in Anchorage. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I really probably learned more about playing jazz there because there were so many musicians uh, that were in the Air Force. That we, my mom used to take me to all the, like, the officers' clubs and they went out on these jam sessions. There was a lot of jazz. But because in different places you live, you grow up hearing whatever, you, whatever music you get. So I went through a heavy rock and roll phase where I was really into King Crimson and Led Zeppelin and jazz. Um, and it, it, it changed my life in terms of just being, dealing with people, dealing with music. So it, it, it clearly had a, a major uh, effect on me. Thank you. Did I see a yeah, question? How does your approach to the <clears throat> drum kit differ in a big band setting versus like a quartet? Playing like maybe the same song, like a standard like caravan. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> It's a lot louder, that's number one. <laughs> um, I think the, the same, I try to keep the same approach or the same underlying feel in either setting. And that basically is my function is to, is to, to kind of take care of whatever's going on. Whether uh, to be aware musically of what's happening and to be able to do what's necessary for the moment. The needs of a big band are much different, and the, the easiest way, a good analogy I like to give, when I play with a big band, it's like being a, like, a, like an airline pilot, okay? Um, the best pilots are the ones, you, you, you don't see, a, pilots don't get famous, because they don't, you don't see them, you don't really know what they do. If you get on a plane and you, you get to where you're going and the flight was nice and smooth, you have no idea that the pilot saved your life like 20 times. <laughs> but the pilot always kind of knows what's, 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 what's going on with the aircraft. They know what's about to go wrong. They can see further ahead. This is a problem. You can steer away from there. Move this way. So when you're dealing with a large group of people, with like, like a, a large orchestra, you have to play in a way which makes everything clear to everybody without, feeling, without them feeling like you're dragging around. So it's a very subtle kind of, of way that you play with them. But you still have to play in a way which is, um, which it's clearly you are in control of the situation. You don't force it, but you have to be, you, know, you, have, to be in, you have to have enough sense to know if something is about to go wrong, you need to fix this. And you need to do it within two to three seconds. <laughs> so um, there's a lot more responsibility in this situation, which is great. Um, I also have to say, the last piece we just played, <laughs> <laughs> both of these, you know, Both of these musicians were just outstanding. And I gotta give a special shout out to, to, to Henry. It, it's, it's very difficult to play really simple, but like your intonation, every note was just so spot on. It provides, a, it's stuff that maybe that you may not recognize. This is like pilot stuff, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's stuff that maybe the audience may not recognize, but if one note is just out of place, it just, the whole house of cards falls down. But, the solo was amazing. You guys were so solid. I'm glad we're recording this, because that was a take. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
promise we're not like paying extra to sales. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you don't need, it's hard for you to really appreciate it, but when you're in situations where that isn't happening, that's when you really know. It's like having a bad file. Like you, you come off the plane, you're like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the file that you're actually going to be about in music. Yeah, those, those are the ones that are famous, right? But it's the ones that you never, you never even blink. Those are the ones that take care of business. That's, that's what's going on here. Yeah. You have a quick question. Uh, why did you count to five at the start? Um, uh, this two or? Oh, it yeah. was the last two of the race. Oh, uh, it, there's, there's two bars. Uh, they, they basically, it's, I gave them a, a bar of time, and I just said five was like the downbeat of the next bar. So instead of one, two, one, ba, 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 or one, two, one, two, three, four, da, da, da. So, I, I gave him five beats, but it, you don't usually count to five in a four-four bar. <laughs> <laughs> You're a drunk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's true enough. It took me so long to realize that, like, that is not in five-four. <laughs> <laughs> no, he. I just gave the down beat. He gave. He, they played the pickups. I was doing the same thing. Another drunk, right? <laughs> yeah, see? This is a hip hop. Yeah. <laughs> So let's, let's be clear, we're talking about this piece we just played? Yes. Okay, no, this was all in four. The, I counted five for There But For The Grace. Okay. Yeah, I think he's talking about that part at the end of the bridge. Right. Uh, there is a part that's, you're a drummer too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these, are, these are my people, right? <laughs> so there, there is a place in there where I, I came up with a figure that I like. I like these chords. And I, I, the idea was to kind of almost, um, Play the chords where it's almost like a part where they're suspended in space, where the, the time widens up. Is what's really going on. The, the, if you musically, it's all notated in four, but the idea is that it, 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 if we were to play it strictly in time, it would make sense. But this is supposed to be this place where it's just supposed to just widen up and, and breathe. And Sheeran's quintet used to do that all the time. There's all these places where the chords would just seem like they just would float, and that was the effect. But in fact, it was in four, and you were exactly right that there was a place <laughs> to But we never changed meters. Mm -hmm. Any other drummers? <laughs> I have a question. Um, you've uh, spoken about writing and arranging for you know, jazz greats mm -hmm. and, uh, from a young age. Mm -hmm. And how early on, how much were you influenced by their playing or their compositions and arrangements? And was there any intentional, not mimicry, but like trying to trying to do something like they would do? And now, years of experience, how much has your writing changed over that time? Um, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one thing that's interesting, and I think hopefully for those of you young musicians and young at heart, um, when I was, I, again, I grew up listening to jazz, and so I always had a healthy respect for music. When I was in high school, I hated big bands. I, I just, they used to get on my nerves. And I had never thought I was ever going to do it. And especially Count Basie's band. That, that sounded so old-timey to me. And so it really wasn't until I got with the band, and I got with that band, because I mean, I knew who Basie was, and yes, I, I respected them, but it wasn't the music of my time. You know, I was really into Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Tower Power, and all this. Um, uh, so it really became a situation where when I got with that band, it was like, okay, this is where you are. You need to get into, into this. Literally, what I had to do, when I found out, I, when, I, when Mr. Basie hired me, I went out and got as many Basie records as I could and tried to approach it almost like, like, a, like a work study. Like, okay, this is my new job. i got to really get into this. It was from being forced to really understand where I was to be able to do a good job for him, that's when I realized, oh my goodness, there's all this long line of three arrangers. And so, yes, it did start coming through osmosis. I did not write like, um, like, and that's that was, I'd been on the band, I think, for maybe about six or eight months. 
but it was from just being completely immersed in all of this music. Uh, now, as a writer, I listened to, naturally, the stuff I did when I was younger, just realized they really were kind to me. Again, the great leaders basically was someone who could see the potential in, in, in what he would do. In fact, and that's that, it's, it's, it, it has been recorded, but when I first took it to the band, and they, they played it, and it was, we didn't get a chance to play it as a full band, we were in a dressing room, and they ran it down. And he's like, yeah, that's really good. You keep writing. <laughs> <laughs> and we never heard that. <laughs> so I, I, I kept trying, I wrote another piece, which, which he did eventually play. It was Thad Jones, when, when Mr. Basie died, and Thad Jones came on the band as the leader, he said, do you have something? I said, you know, what would you bring it up? So I brought that, and that's when we started recording it. Um, but it really is, Frank Foster, I'll stop talking for a second, no, no. always said, you know, his, his, his whole, his mantra was, the minute you, you stop writing, the minute you finish, the minute you finish an arrangement, you start writing the next one. And it really was a learning process, no matter what you did, or no matter what it sounded like, that's over, now is what's going on. And in a way, I think that has been a great, not only um, musical advice, but it's kind of life advice where this is where we were, now today is where we are. This is what we're doing right now. And it's kind of been something I, I, I try to keep in mind, whether it's compositionally, try something different, whatever's happening musically, get into, get into that right now. Um, so, I started like writing music like a year ago. I have like a little MIDI keyboard and I've been using GarageBand to like make little jazz compositions. Um, and I never struggle to find motivation to like start writing something. But I have like probably about 100 like unfinished ideas just like sitting on my computer. Have you like, do you have issues with that? Um. You, I'm not sure I understand your question. Do I have uh, issues? Say, say to shake, you know, like, okay. find motivation to, like, finish the grab or whatever. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing that happens, and this is something that I learned from great professional writers, Michael Abeni is another amazing arranger, and he had a work ethic where he basically saw that, like, I'm a professional arranger, it's my job. I wake up, I write, and then it took a while for him to get the discipline I'm not sure if it took a while for him, to probably take him any time. But it took a while for me to get that discipline of like, you gotta stick with this, you gotta do it. Um, at first it's fun. You know, it's like, yeah, this is me. But then it becomes a job. But that's part of the, the, the professional work ethic. You know, you, and the deadline. Uh, you know, they're waiting for it. You, get, you, gotta, you gotta come up with something. The one thing I would suggest for you to do, and this is something that even now, I, I'm just buzzing. You know, it's one thing for a computer to play, because it's going to sound exactly, it's going to sound exactly like what you put in it. But when you have real people play, all of a sudden, it's just, it's, it really is having an out-of-body experience. It's like having a dream, and someone tells you exactly what your dream was. And I'll never forget the first time I actually wrote music down and had people who I didn't know play it. But naturally, it sounds like what you wrote, but there's always that extra something special that they put into it, and you're just like, it's, it's like it becomes three-dimensional. And I, I, it freaked me out. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so amazing to hear humans play it. So even if it's, if it's not a complete composition, I was told, any students or whatever, if you've got like, like four bars or something, just write it and pass it out to people, and just hear it. Because when, when you hear it in, in real life, in 3D, it'll inspire you to like, well, I want to finish it. Or, well, that doesn't sound good, but if I change that, or you can, and then you can ask questions, well, what if you change this and you do that? Then it becomes like this living thing. And then, I, I guarantee you, you will not have trouble. It, it's frustrating now as a professional because usually you don't really get to hear it until the recording, or until it's like really serious and it's gotta be right. So that's, the, that's another pressure which we'll get into, but <laughs> write it out and bring it to people. Yeah, it'll change your life. <laughs> I love that.
Well, okay, we have one more. Go for it. I was just wondering if you had any uh, early compositions that you felt weren't quite there yet, and you just threw them aside, and then years later saw them new eyes, new filters, and took it from there. The first piece we played, as I said, when I wrote it, when I passed it out, they were like, you know, and they didn't say, he wasn't part, like I said, he didn't, just didn't say, this is, we don't like this. And I didn't really, I thought, oh, that, that was it, I failed. It wasn't until, you, it, that was in 83 when I wrote that, and it was 85 when we oh, okay. played it again. And almost all these things that we're playing, I was, I was explaining to, to Noah and Henry, um, some of them were, we, we either recorded it, and then I haven't played it since. Time is funny, yeah. and, and, and the other advice I would give you, if you pass something out you, and, and people play it and it doesn't sound good, don't necessarily think it's you. <laughs> 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 because maybe people don't understand what it was you made. Maybe they, they, they read it wrong, maybe it just didn't sound good. Don't throw it away. The good thing about all the digital stuff and it's all on a computer is that it's just hard drive space. So don't ever throw it away. Yeah. You might use that idea later, or you might use a fragment, or you might do the whole thing but with a better band. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden it's like, wow, this sounds amazing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there, time does play a, a role, but we're all together in this room. Never underestimate the, the, the value of humans. <laughs> People are important, and sometimes just different, different set of hands. It sounds completely different. People are important. People are important. <laughs> They're really important. <laughs> um, well, so um, before before we uh, introduce and then play the one remaining tune on our docket, how about a hand for Henry we'll go on. Yeah. Yeah. Originally, when Noah had told me, contacted me and told me the concept of this, he said, you know, pieces and you can send music. I really hadn't thought about what I would play. Um, I, I believe it was, he was the one who suggested this piece, and I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about this too. Because it was written for uh, McCoy Tyner's Big Man, and I'd, I'd never played it in a trio, until today, I'd never played it in a, in a trio set. Um, All these songs have a story. Um, <laughs> so from working in New York and playing in different big bands, there was a great lead trumpet player who was the lead trumpet player for the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra named Earl, named Earl Gardner. Mm -hmm. And Earl also played lead trumpet for McCoy Tyner's big band. McCoy Tyner's this great legend, and, and right. when, he put, when he put a big band together, it was just awesome to hear. And all of a sudden, um, I think McCoy just called me. And, you know, it's one of those people you answer the phone was like, who is this? It's McCoy Tyler. <laughs> but Earl had recommended me to him and said, you know, would you write something for the band? I'm like, well, sure. So um, this created, uh, this was the beginning of, of, a, of a, another, friendship is almost too casual a word because I just referenced this man. And it was a, a learning experience dealing with a master who, again, was just the most gentle, a gentleman, in every sense of the word. And so this was, uh, this was another deadline. They, ran, they had a recording session coming up, and he asked if I could contribute two pieces to the record. Um, I think the reason, this, this is more of a technical reason, I called it Choices because um, it's basically, uh, a, a, I think, F minor, but it's kind of got like this half-step chromatic thing all throughout the piece. And there's always the question about like, well, is it, 
G flat or F? You know, <laughs> what's it going to be? And I like that that tension. And McCoy's playing is you know very much in, in either pentatonics or chromatics. So I there were so many choices I had to make in this piece. I call it choices. So, but it's for the point time. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Appreciate all of you.